Good afternoon and welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical. I hope you had a great weekend. We've had a lot of rain. This is the Indian Ocean dipole weather system, which is parching Australia and bringing a lot of rain to East Africa. Um, but I found some beautiful sunrise photographs from Isiodo Waia. What a beautiful morning. This was actually in November. The sun rising over the Iwaso Nero River near Shaba National Reserve. It's a beautiful landscape and I imagine a lot more beautiful with all the rain that we've had of late as well. Every man and every woman is a star, Alistair Crowley, via a devoted yogi, I couldn't agree more. Hello Mombasa, this is Adrian Tweetsky in my hometown, and a lovely photograph from him as well. Lewis Carroll is life but a dream, a boat beneath a sunny sky. Lingering onward dreamily in an evening of July. Children three that nestle near, eager eye and willing ear, pleased a simple tale to hear. Long has paled that sunny sky, echoes fade and memories die. Autumn frosts have slain July. Still she haunts me, phantom-wise, Alice moving under skies, never seen by waking eyes, children yet the tale to hear, eager eye and willing ear, lovingly shall nestle near. In a wonderland they lie, dreaming as the days go by, dreaming as the summers die. Ever drifting down the stream, lingering in the golden gleam. Life, what is it but a dream? In all our life then but a dream, seen faintly in the golden gleam, athwart time's dark, resistless stream, bowed to the earth with bitter woe, or laughing at some rarey show, we flutter idly to and fro. Man's little day in haste we spend, and from its merry noontide send, no glance to meet the silent end, Lewis Carroll. The New York Times has an extraordinary long read called The Jungle Prince of Delhi. For 40 years, journalists chronicle the eccentric royal family of Uth, deposed aristocrats who lived in a ruined palace in the Indian capital. It was a tragic, astonishing story, but was it true? On a spring afternoon in 2016, when I was working in India, I received a telephone message from a recluse who lived in a forest in the middle of Delhi. Office manager, Ellen, have you been trying to get in touch with the royal family of Ood? Office manager, it was quite strange. The secretary left precise instructions for when you should call her tomorrow between 11 a.m. and 12 noon. Some people said the Ood family had been there since the British had, had annexed their kingdom in 1856 and that the forest had grown up around the palace engulfing it. Some said they were a family of jinns, the supernatural beings of Arabian folklore. One thing was sure, they didn't want company. They lived in a 14th century hunting lodge, which they surrounded with loops of razor wire and ferocious dogs. The perimeter was marked with menacing signs, Intruders shall be gunned down, said one. In 1997, the prince and the princess told the Times of London that their mother, in a final gesture of protest against the treachery of Britain and India, had killed herself by drinking a poison mix with crushed diamonds and pearls. Nearly every day, dropping my children at school, I drove past the narrow road that led into the middle of the forest, which was surrounded by an ornate wrought-iron fence. The woods were so thick, 
It was impossible to see much and inhabited by gangs of monkeys. At night you could hear jackals howling. The woods themselves were a bit magical, a thicket in the middle of a city of twenty million. We drove further until the tree canopy was tormented thick enough to block out the light. The Ood family refused famously to meet with Indians. I asked the driver to wait at a distance and stood in the woods somewhat awkwardly, holding my notebook and wondering what came next. He was elfin and wore high-waisted mob jeans. He had high cheekbones with hollows beneath them and wild grey hair that stood up in tufts. I am Cyrus, the prince said. It was the high-pitched voice I had heard on the phone. He spoke in bursts like a person who spent most of the time alone. I stepped into spare medieval grandeur, a bare stone antechamber lined with palm trees and brass pots and faded once elegant carpets. On the wall hung an oil painting of the prince's mother, swathed in voluminous dark robes, her eyes closed as if in a trance. Other great cities may be built on top of ruins, but, Del but Delhi is built of them. It is almost impossible to go from one point to another without stumbling over a 1,700-year-old tomb or a 500-year-old fort. I am shrinking, he said. We are shrinking. The princess is shrinking. We are shrinking. The story began with his mother. She appeared on the platform of New Delhi's train station in the early 1970s seemingly from nowhere, announcing herself as Wilayat, Begum of Ud, a kingdom that no longer existed. The British annexed it in 1856, a trauma from which its capital, Lucknow, never recovered. The Begum declared that she would stay in the station until these properties had been restored to her. She settled in the VIP waiting room and unloaded a whole household there, carpets, potted palms, a silver tea set, Nepali servants in livery, glossy great dames. But she also had two grown children, Prince Ali Raza and Princess Sakina, a son and a daughter, who appeared to be in their twenties. They addressed her as Your Highness, an arresting-looking woman, tall and broad-shouldered, with a face as craggy and immobile as an Easter Island statue. She wore a sari of dark, heavy silk and kept a pistol in its folds. She and her children settled on red plastic chairs and waited for years. They were more obedient than the dogs, he said. They were absolutely under her control. The Nepali servants, they would walk on their knees, said Salim, a historian who sought them out at the time. The chief minister of Uttar Pradesh was sent to New Delhi as a liaison. He recalled handing Vilayat an envelope with 10,000 rupees so they could set up a household in Lucknow. The Begum imposed stringent conditions. She could only be photographed when the moon was waning, United Press International reported. In 1984, her efforts paid off. Prime Minister Gandhi accepted their claim, granting them use of a 14th century hunting lodge known as Malcha Mahal. They left the train station roughly a decade after they first appeared there. Wilayet never appeared in public again. So I found it a relief to drive into the forest and sit on Cyrus's porch, eating pistachios and watching motes of pollen circulate in the sunlight. Old timers remembered Cyrus and his family, but they told me almost as an aside that they had been dismissed as impostors. The Ood descendants in Calcutta, where the Nawab died in exile, had also rejected their claim. Once he asked me to kiss him on the cheek. His skin felt fragile, like tissue paper, and he told me it was the first time he'd been kissed in ten years. When you are over here, my heart goes doopity do, Sophia Loren, he said. Rajinder Kumar, one of the guards, said it seemed to be dengue fever. Is Cyrus a white whale was the subject of an email I sent my editor. 
I had become curious, obsessively curious, about how a family with wealth and status had become lost in the forest and who they were. This is what was going through my head as I climbed those stairs. Cyrus's death had received lots of media coverage inside India and abroad, and thrill-seekers had tramped through Malcha Mahal, taking video with their phones, hoping to see a ghost. The floor of the entry hall was a havoc of discarded papers that had been dumped from the wardrobe and chest of drawers. The first was a stack of receipts for regular small transfers of cash through Western Union from a city in the industrial north of England. The sender identified himself as a half-brother. I am in so much pain I cannot go to the toilet even, the writer began, and after an extensive catalogue of physical ailments went on to complain about the burden of providing continuous financial support for Villiard and her children. He was obviously not a rich man. For God's sake, try to sort yourselves out financially in case anything goes wrong with me. The letter was signed Shahid and it was sent from an address in Bradford, Yorkshire. Oud was ruled at the time by a Nawab named Wajid Ali Shah, a dreamy aesthete who spent his time orchestrating lavish entertainments in a harem that he called the Parikana, or abode of fairies. He thought the British were his allies because his great uncle had extended them vast loans. The territories of Oud shall be henceforth vested forever in the Honourable East India Company. The Queen of Oud is disendowed of regions rich and juicy, their milk and honey, I mean their money, squeezed out by Lord Dalhousie. There were descendants, Wajid Ali Shah had hundreds of wives and concubines, people identifying themselves as, descend as descendants are all over the place in Lucknow, fighting like polecats over the veracity of one another's claims. It wasn't just me, the whole public was coming to see her and was going crazy. People would cry to see her in this condition. We have got ev documentary evidence, I said. Get it. She said, I will give it only to those persons who are in authority. She showed us certain pieces of crockery and all that, which were, of course, antiques. But she did not show us any documents. The family left Lucknow abruptly, he said. Something had happened. An elderly aunt said she recognised Wilayat from before partition. The aunt said Wilayat was an ordinary woman then, the young wife of a civil servant. To my mind, this lady was a megalomaniac, he said. She should have been psychologically tested. Her assessment of her children, however, was quite different. They believed their mother, he said, because she was their mother. Then she goes to Bradford and she meets Cyrus's brother uh, Shahid. They were or had been an ordinary family. Their father had been the registrar of Lucknow University in Ayuta Labat. My friend's name was not Prince Cyrus or Prince Ali Reza or Prince anything. He was plain old Mickey Butt. I'm so confused I don't know who I am, he said. I'm like a bird, a long lost bird, a lost lamb. He had an older brother, Bhatt, who was a pilot in the Pakistani Air Force. She thought she was the Princess of Oud, but this was never, never, ever. We never heard this history about the Princess of this and the Princess of that. She obviously had some mental disorder. Everything is alike, Lida said. They are dead, just leave them. God forgives them, so we should also forgive them. <clears throat> She was confined to a mental hospital in Lahore for six months, Shahid said, to avoid a long prison sentence. Chained to a wall, it was four chains. She was swinging and spitting at everybody who went past. Williat was given electro electroshock therapy. They said she was mental. They gave her all these injections. When she was free, she gathered up her youngest children without warning, packed trunks with carpets and jewellery, and smuggled it all back into India with the goal of reclaiming her property. Shahid set out with them, but eventually walked away. He could not put into words why he left. His story flickers out there. They took on new identities. Fahad became Princess Sakina, occasionally Princess Alexandrina. Mickey became Prince Ali Raza, and later called himself Prince Cyrus. They no longer made any mention of their Pakistani relatives or the spacious family house in Lahore that was waiting for them should they return. 
Maybe they forgot it existed. They seemed to shed their past entirely, to come from nowhere. What a story. And then he's buried in an unmarked grave. This is a photograph of Prince Cyrus of Oud at his family home in New Delhi. This is from Pol Polaroids of Wilayat, Cyrus and daughter Sakina. The house in a thick forest in the middle of a city of 20 million. Uh, Wilayat left and her children received visitors at the station. Lucknow is studded with shrines and palaces of Oud Nawabs, whose kingdom was annexed by the British in 1856. Sarah Sakin in a servant in 1998 on the roof of Malcha Mahal. They called their mother, Your Highness, and when she died, they embalmed her body themselves. Here you see the streets of New Delhi in 1947. Partition led to deadly fights. Wilayat and Sakina travelled to Lucknow to lay claim to their ancestral properties. It's like, what a story, incredible. Here you see a camel silhouetted against the setting sun in the desert near Dakla in Morocco, administered Western Sahara, that's AFP. Man underscore integrated in an interesting diversion says, humans are three-dimensional creatures ruled by sight and instinct. We are born with two eyes on the front of our head this is a predatory trait. We live in XYZ space, defining things by their length, width and depth. Time is the fourth dimension. It imparts scale and scope for movement in the third dimension. It is nebulous, powerful, intransigent. Time is the only certainty we have. Our lives begin at one point and ends at another, but it has rules and can be manipulated for gain. Time is merely our perception of the duration between events. It is fluid. Standardization was necessary to make society operate more smoothly. It is possible to operate in the fourth dimension consistently, in fact. It is essential to do so. Action follows perception. Perception, however, is a reaction to externalities to the untrained mind. Taking control of the time domain begins a conceptual spiral. When you begin to compress and contract the opponent's time, he reacts to outdated information. Time to shift the third dimension in your favour. This is how you control minds and manifest your will into reality. In business, time rules all. It is how money compounds exponentially. If you want to win at anything, you must master the fourth dimension. It is the hidden energy connecting things in space. When you can generate and control your opponent's conceptual spiral, you have conquered him. This will place you in the top 0.1% of human excellence. That took me back to at the moment of vision, the eyes see nothing. And I said the moment of vision is in essence a non-linear thing. It's a moment of deep insight. I've found as I have gotten older that time and even the world simply does not move in a linear fashion. I then was writing about streaming dreams and non-linearity. And in October 2014, I was writing about escape velocity exponential, um, saying that viruses exhibit non-linear and exponential characteristics and that the high-tech millennial crypto avocado economy exhibits viral, wildfire, and exponential and even non-linear characteristics. This is the Bitcoin avocado correlation is reasserting itself and fair value for Bitcoin right now looks around to be $4,000, says Tracy Alloway. Congratulations to Benson Kanyembo, winner of this year's Tusk Org Wildlife Ranger Award. That's from Tusk Awards. Poachers are not resting, so why should we? That's what Ranger Benson Kanyembo has said. Political reflections with 3 million voters casting ballots, pro-democracy candidates captured 389 of 452 elected seats, up from only 124 and far more than they've ever won. There has been a very deep awakening of the Hong Kong people, said Alan Leong, chairman of the Civic Party. Unless the CCP is doing something concrete to address the concerns of the Hong Kong people, he said, I think this movement cannot end. Joshua Wong told German media, Hong Kong is das neue Berlin in October. And as I wrote then, the folks in Hong Kong are in open rebellion. The question is, where do we go from here? My piece over the weekend, if Iran wants to eat, it has to obey the US. 
Iran's only crime is we decided not to fold, said Javad Zarif, the foreign minister of Iran, as reported by the Asia Times' Pepe Escobar. Zarif evoked Secretary Mike Pompeo, who is apparently trying to parachute himself out of the State Department and back to Kansas, Ukraine refers. Today, the Secretary of State of the United States says publicly if Iran wants to eat, it has to obey the United States. Since 1979, and except for a brief interregnum during the presidency of Barack Hussein Obama, the U.S. has been determined on a collision course with the Velayat e Faqih, known as Islamic Government, is a book by the Iranian Muslim cleric and revolutionary Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, first published in 1970, and probably the most influential document written in modern times in support of theocratic rule. The end of the brief interregnum to which I referred was pronounced and of course theatrically when President Trump pulled the US out of the 2015 nuclear deal, a pact which had traded limits on Iran's fuel program for a relaxation of international sanctions. President Trump has been a big proponent of coercive financial currency and sanction warfare and his policy of maximum pressure on Iran is that policy's apogee. The Shia crescent is burning from Syria through Lebanon, from Iraq to Yemen, but Tehran has always been the prize. Bloomberg asked last week, Iran unrest raises a question, is maximum pressure working? Anti-government protests in Iran left buses and banks burned, hundreds under arrest and the internet blocked and an unconfirmed number of people dead. The unrest was sparked by Tehran's decision last week to both ration and raise the price of gasoline, but there was ready tinder to be lit, consisting of the sorts of frustrations that have stoked violence around the globe in recent months, from Bolivia, Chile and Venezuela, to Hong Kong, Iraq and Lebanon. Crude oil exports on which Iran relies for much of its hard currency earnings have fallen to about 250,000 barrels per day, from a peak of 2.5 million barrels per day in April last year. The IMF has forecast a 9.5% contraction for Iran this year, and inflation is clocking 36%. Clearly, we are witnessing a global phenomenon from Latin America to the Middle East, to Hong Kong, and the wave of protests shaking the world resembles a global uprising against neoliberalism, Middle East I. And it does behove us to diagnose the, de the disease, otherwise we will be prescribing the wrong medicine. For example, take Bolivia and Latin America in general, where the prescription of the likes of Janine Anes and Jair Bolsonaro, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free, is to take neoliberalism to the ultimate extreme, that killing us like dogs, common dreams. China and even India are seeking to zinyang the periphery. This is a global phenomenon, and Iran is reaping, similarly, a whirlwind. However, what is also clear is that Team Pompeo is seeking to accelerate the Iranian situation towards a denouement, of course, the origins of the protests are spontaneous. However, Pompeo has some very curious bedfellows. Mark Owen Jones tweeted, Mike Pompeo tweeted on the 21st of November, a request in Farsi for Iranian protesters to send in videos of the regime's crackdown in order to expose and sanction the abuses. Both tweets, including the translation, got a lot of retweets, but by whom? He downloaded the retweets of each tweet. For the translated tweet, he analyzed 3,600 individual accounts that retweeted it. Interestingly, the most cohesive community and most commonly biographical detail was once again MAGA, indeed 825 of the accounts retweeting it. As we've come to expect, many of these MAGA accounts were created in January 2017 and January 2018. This is the same type of profile we've seen accounts tweeting for a hard Brexit. <clears throat> Pompeo has allied himself with the People's Mojahedin Organization of Iran, 
and its cult-like leader, Maryam Rajavi, who tweeted, the whole issue is that the Velayat Rifaki regime is on its last leg. The alliance of Pompeo, the MAGA tweet army, Maryam Rajavi and the MEK is just not credible. It's incredible. Of course, Arab NATO, which includes the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the GCC and Israel is a lot more credible and they are surely guiding the inferno. However, if a civil war is ignited in the Shia crescent and the nature of the hybrid warfare indicates this is the direction of travel, the implosion will engender catastrophic consequences which will be impossible to manage and will surely imperil Arab NATO itself. Oil is the purest proxy and is at an eight-week high. The series of threads from Mark Owen Jones are there as well. <clears throat> then a tweet from Theo4801. I would have guessed it was coordination with the MEK bot army, but it looks like that is not the case then. Um, and then there's a link for Mariam Rajavi as well. Pompeo scorns the law because he's never had to follow it. This is counterpunch Robert Fisk. What Pompeo meant was that this vital adherence to world law, whereby under the Fourth Geneva Convention occupying powers cannot plant their own citizens on occupied and stolen land, no longer suited the United States and Israel. Of course, it hadn't worked because the Palestinians rigidly trusted the laws which the world accepted after the Second World War. The Economist rise in the price of petrol, a fueling unrest in Iran. Amnesty said over a hundred protesters nationwide had been killed. Protesters burned portraits of the Supreme Leader Khamenei and shouted, Mullahs get lost. Um, citizens near the sites of protests received anonymous messages saying, we know you are here. Supreme Leader denounced the protesters as thugs and blamed the centers of villainy around the world that oppose us. Um, uh, Rouhani has boasted he has fended off America's campaign to exert maximum pressure on Iran after Trump dumped the deal to curb Iran's nuclear program. It's the, still the second biggest economy after Saudi Arabia, but the sanctions are obviously hurting, says The Economist. A senior civil servant on the equivalent of $2,000 a month at the start of this year may now be earning $400. Food prices are rising faster than inflation. The regime is toughening up. It has become more belligerent abroad, cruel at home and less democratic. So far, the protests have failed to make it change course. Um, as I said in my article in May 2019, I was quoting Hunter S. Thompson, there is no honest way to explain it because the only people who really know where it is, the edge, are the ones who have gone over. Um, they're killing us like dogs. That was my reference to this article in Common Dreams. A massacre in Bolivia and a plea for help. November 19, military massacre at the Senkata gas plant in the indigenous city of El Alto and the tear gassing of a peaceful funeral procession on November 21st to commemorate the dead. Evo Morales tweeted, Los golpistas intentan criminalizar con montajes mis denuncias de violaciones a los DDHH. World exclusive Chinese spy spills secrets to expose communist espionage. 60 minutes interview on, in Australia. Uh, Trump, as I said, you know, in my article in 2016, <coughs> we have a deviate tomahawk. And in an article in the Washington Post, Trump not only picks up propaganda from domestic sources carrying Putin's water, which worked its way into American information ecosystems, sloshing around until parts of it reached Mr. Trump. The first thing I said in 2016 is plausible deniability. The second thing is non-linearity. <coughs> Continuing to feed the hothouse conspiracy frenzy online, a constant state of destabilized perception. In 2016, it was all about timely and judicious doses of WikiLeaks leaks. What kind of insurance does Rudy Giuliani have on Trump? He just told Fox News that's why Trump will not throw him under the bus. Is Rudy Trump's lawyer or his boss? We should know. At this point, I'm surprised Devin Nunes doesn't read his opening statements in Russian and cut out the middleman, says Gary Kasparov. Obviously, Giuliani wants Trump to hear the threat and be deterred. 
Then I saw a tweet from uh, um, Ambassador Bolton, a great moment in military history as we regain control of the Twitter account. Man integrated, one of the most important instruments of great power policy is the subsurface naval fleet. These deadly predators are both fascinating and little understood outside of Hollywood depictions. Submarines offer a modern navy a fully three-dimensional arsenal. The threat to an adversary of a silent killer sliding into a theatre of operations <coughs> and being able to sink any vessel, <coughs> launch missiles inland or unexpectedly ruin the best battle plan is a major deterrent. And he's basically saying that the US is not able to get into the literal zone you know, on the boundary of uh, China, for example. And his theory is that China's naval bases in places like Djibouti fully capable of docking resupplying submarines as well as launching shore-based anti-sub operations. Um, and he's saying that's what the purpose, dual purpose of the Belt and Road really is. Let's move on to international markets. <coughs> Euro, one ten twenty-five dollar index, 98.256. Japanese yen, 108.82. Swiss franc 0.9971, the pound 128.49, the Australian dollar 0.6795, India rupee 71.6325, South Korean won 1175.735, the real 420, Egyptian pound 1610, and the rand 14.67. Dollar is still well bid at 98.25, euro dollar, this chart is from FX, Pip Titan. Uh, 110.26. This is ideological imperialism, six unelected individuals in Silicon Valley imposing their vision on the rest of the world, unaccountable to any government and acting like they're above the reach of the law. Incredible speech by Sasha Baron Cohen. And I've written about Facebook in March 2018. I was quoting Andrew Nix. We just put information into the bloodstream to the internet. Watch it grow. Give it a little push every now and again over time to watch it take shape. And so this stuff infiltrates the online community and expands but with no branding. So it's unattributable, untraceable. It's no use fighting elections on the facts. It's all about emotions. So the candidate is the puppet always replied Nix. I said in an extraordinary boomerang, the US's adversaries have turned social media on its head and used it as a Trojan horse via psychographic profiling and micro-targeting at a mass scale. I was saying then the fundamental challenge for Facebook is this, it has represented itself as an intermediary. An intermediary works as a personal agent on behalf of consumers to help them take control over information gathered about them. Uh, I was referencing John Hagel's book, Net Worth. However, I said Facebook has been hawking this information as if it were an intermediary. This is its trust gap, and that gap is set to widen further. Bitcoin matches record losing run in fall to six month low. We're now rebounding a little at 6,700. Sank nearly 10% to the lowest in six months. Um, According to Bloomberg Composite Pricing, first time since May that Bitcoin traded below $7,000. Um, as I said, on the 30th of September, the end is nigh. It could fall as far as $1,000, where it was in January 2017. This is a chart from a guy in a flannel. Um, uh, and this is another chart back in January 2018, 15000 We flagged that Bitcoin was a classic bubble. Since then, the charts keep giving. Currently, having broken support, the next stop is a gap to 6,426, then sub 5,000 and 3,000. Ultimately, if that doesn't hold 500. As I said, I'm of the view that Bitcoin and crypto is a Jeffrey Edward Epstein and his cast of characters level con. It's breathtaking. Um, I reference you to this deleted tweet from Bruce Fenton, who made that allegation. And Vanity Fair have an extraordinary article, Ponzi Schemes, Private Yachts, and a Missing $250 Million in Crypto, The Strange Tale of Quadriga. Very well worth reading. The Smiling Boy visited Sunnybrook Yachts in the summer of 2017 after the value of Bitcoin had reached an all-time high, having tripled in five months. Sunnybrook is the largest yacht brokerage 
on Canada's east coast. Its clients tended to be surgeons and litigators and sea suiters who traveled from Toronto and Paris and Hawaii to summer in Nova Scotia. And it really is an extraordinary tale that Vanity Fair have. You've got to read it. And it's not clear if Jerry is still alive or dead. Gold, let's take a look at that. 1459. Crude oil, 5796. Africa, Ethiopia's Abbey may have unleashed the genie from the jar by allowing a little democracy in Africa's second most populous nation to have a vote. More than 80 ethnic groups this week, last week the Sidama, who account for about 4% of the country's 108 million people, voted on whether <coughs> to create a regional state that could give them more autonomy. I think the vote was 98.5% in favour of more autonomy. Well, I wrote about Abi when he got the Nobel Prize, and I said he faces a fiendishly complicated task, fending off the centripetal forces which are tearing Ethiopia apart. When he was in power for 90 days, I said these 90 or so days represent the most consequential arrival of an African politician on the African stage since Mandela walked out of prison, blinking in the sunlight, and constructed his rainbow nation. But the Sadama vote is, his biggest challenge is, is this, that there are all these ethnic groups and they're all going to want uh, more and more power. They voted overwhelmingly to form an autonomous region. Initial results show 98.5% voted to back autonomy. Another set of anti-third term protests underway in Guinea as opposition and civil society lead the march against a potential referendum which would allow 81-year-old President Alpha Conde to run for a third term. Zimbabwe, in a fantastic article in the Africa Report, The Secrets Behind Mugabe's Demise. From the rise of Gucci Grace to the fall of Comrade Bob, to Emerson Manangagwa's incredible escape, the book Secrets of History recounts the riveting story of the presidential couple's last weeks in power. Grace Mugabe is hardly ever seen leaving her private villa in Mount Pleasant, in the upscale suburb of Harare, where she has been taken refuge with her daughter Bona after deserting the cursed Blue Roof Mansion. If she doesn't come out anymore, it's because she's afraid of being stoned to death, believes one of Zimbabwe's many critics of grace. The opaque elite who have governed this country for four decades stand united. When you can't kill yourself, you make compromises. The secret story of Grace's rise following Mugabe's fall is told by Zimbabwean journalist and writer Douglas Rogers in a detailed investigation. At an extraordinary meeting of Zalu PF Central Committee, Mugabe announces his decision to appoint the First Lady to head the female branch of the ruling party and her subsequent entry into the political bureau. The First Lady acts like a second president. She summons ministers, attends hearings with a notebook in her hand, and appoints members of her own stable, the Generation 40, G40, to head local federations. Grace's first target is a woman who poses a major threat to her ambition of succeeding her husband. Her nickname during the war was Terry Ropa, the one who spills blood. Joyce enjoys undeniable legitimacy to the point that many Zimbabweans see her as the natural heir to Comrade Bob. After appointment to political office, Grace launches a campaign against Joyce, calling her a conspirator and determined to avenge her husband's death and seize power. In December 2014, Mugabe gives in. He dismisses Mujuru and eight ministers deemed close to her. Her successor as vice president is another veteran, Emerson Manangagwa. This will be Grace Mugabe's second target. Even more than Joyce, Manangagwa is a respected personality among veterans and the leading figure of ZANU-PF so-called Lacoste Group, a reference to the crocodile-shaped logo of the famous French sportswear brand, which brings together the liberators of Zimbabwe. For three decades, Manangagwa executed the wishes of his leader without hesitation. As Minister of Security in 1983, he supervised the bloody Guka Rahundi operation the rain that sweeps away garbage in Matabili land, resulting in the deaths of 20,000 people in nine months. 
In 1998, he was deployed to the DR Congo, where he coordinated the Zimbabwean contingent support for the Laurent Désiré Kabila regime. It allows senior officers to enrich themselves through the trafficking of copper and diamonds. The plan devised by Grace in a G40 was simple. Her husband, once re-elected, will resign in her favour, but first she must be reappointed as vice president. After consuming ice cream from Grace Mugabe's dairy farm, the vice president collapses. He was evacuated to a hospital in Johannesburg. Manangagwa and his entourage are convinced that Grace laced his food with arsenic. When asked about this accusation a few days later during a talk show on ZBC, Grace laughed, saying, Why would I want to kill Manangagwa? Who is Manangagwa on this earth? Killing someone my husband made, it doesn't make any sense. Standing with a microphone in her hand, dressed like a rock star, she, she screams, traitors and usurpers will be eliminated. As Grace gets up from her chair to deliver a new diatribe, the crowd, mostly made up of veterans, explodes in jeers while waving hundreds of toy crocodiles. Mugabe lifts a bony finger and says, you insult and denigrate the first lady on behalf of Manangagwa. All right, I'll fire him. At nightfall, they both walk along a smuggler's trail that will take them to Mozambique. Police, equipped with powerful flashlights and sniffer dogs, are looking for them. Manangagwen Jr., who firmly holds his father's Louis Vuitton bag, containing $8,000 in small bills, are forced to cross a swamp and crawl through the mud to escape them. They meet a mystic with amulets, who shows them the way and chases away evil spirits in exchange for a few dollars. In Harare, the news of Manangagwa's escape is greeted with jubilation by Grace in the G40. Finally, rid of the crocodile, says Mugabe. His wife's official appointment as vice president is scheduled for 16th November. Euphoric, Grace makes preparations for a grand ceremony, but nothing will go as planned. And eventually, this, the first on his list of suspects is none other than the chief of the army staff, General Constantino Chiwengwa, who came back over the weekend from a four-week, uh, four-month illness in China. A relative of Manangagwa, with whom he served during Operation Kukurahundi, Mugabe orders his arrest as soon as he steps on the tarmac at Harare Airport after returning from a working visit to China. However, he is aware of this plot, and he surrounds those who have been sent to arrest him. And eventually, Grace and Robert Mugabe find the coup is done against them. Mugabe resigns for $10 million signing bonus legal immunity, a promise that the couple's property would not be seized. The next day, Manangagwa returns to Harare. His first gesture is to reward the three generals who ran the operation. Chiwengwa was appointed vice president. Parents Shiri becomes minister of lands. And Subisiso Moyo takes over as minister of foreign affairs. Look, I think Zimbabwe is at a tipping point moment. I really am. I saw a recent tweet saying the army is on high alert. Inflation is above 500%. Um, you know, there's definitely a correlation between high inflation and revolutionary conditions. The mind game that they played on their citizens, in my view, has evaporated in a puff of smoke. He can go to Dubai all he wants, but eventually there's going to be an uprising. As he was eulogizing Mugabe as a revolutionary icon, he's failed and he's frankly as untenable as his erstwhile mentor. Chiwengwa returned and was interestingly received by no government minister but, but by the deputy Chinese ambassador, reunited tweeted Piers Pigou. S&P South Africa outlook revised to negative on worsening fiscal and debt trajectory, ratings are firm, low GDP, upwardly revised fiscal deficits and a growing debt burden are damaging South Africa's fiscal metrics. South African oil shares up 7.63% year-to-date, dollar rand 14.66, Egypt pound 16.1, EGX 30 up 7.78% year-to-date, Nigeria oil share down 14.12% year-to-date, Ghana stock exchange down 14.06% year-to-date, Morocco issued a 1 billion euro euro bond, um, at 1.5% 12-year maturity. Smoke rises from the scene after a small plane crashed in Goma. Moody's says Kenya faces challenges of high debt, subdued revenue, high and rising government debt constrains Kenya's credit profile. Loosening fiscal policy leading to increasing government debt would, result, would likely result in downgrade. 
I think the downgrade is predicted, predictable and inevitable. Kenya is to discuss a standby loan facility in early 2020 with the IMF that previously had a $1.5 billion facility which expired in September 2018. Companies struggle with late payments as Kenya faces cash crisis, that's Bloomberg. Daniel Mwangi's construction company in Nairobi's battling to stay afloat has fired about a thousand workers in the past year as Kenya's government struggles to pay contractors. To finance the president's ambitious plans, the government tapped the international market three times in the past five years for about seven billion dollars in eurobonds and more in multiple syndicated loans. The Treasury estimates it will spend 39% of its target revenue on servicing debt this fiscal year. Kenya is on the wrong fiscal path and the government is doing little to correct that, said Tony Watima. Kenya's economic growth has been hit and expansion will probably slow to 5.8% this year. Government has raised its budget gap forecast to 6.3% of GDP. Impact on businesses has been severe with delayed payments amounting to at least 172 billion shillings as of June. Kenyan businesses impact is also seen in debt defaults, non-performing loans increased to 13% at the end of August from 11% two years ago. Banks have done a lot of restructuring to these loans, but they can only do this for so long, said John Gachora. The next two fiscal years will be a polarised political environment due to succession politics, making structural adjustments unpopular, said Watima. Kenya's medium-term outlook is gloomy. Unless the government makes structural adjustments now, it's going to be a turbulent time. 91-day T-bill is at 7.1%, 182-day T-bill at 8.2%, and 364-day T-bill at 9.8%. Uh, 2018 Eurobond issue, the 10-year is at 6.6%, 30-year at 8%. 2019, 7 years at 6.2%, 12-year at 7.3%. On a year-to-date basis, the shilling has appreciated by 0.5% against the dollar. Diaspora remittances, uh, $2.8 billion as at October 2019, from 2.6 billion recorded in a similar period of review in 2018. Nairobi shares up 10.26% year-to-date, trades on a PE of 11.8 and a dividend yield of 6.1. The NSE 20 is down 7.59%. Thank you.